All right, we'll call tonight's study session to order. And welcome again to everyone here tonight. Uh, I think the first item on the agenda is a presentation from the Achieve Banal and the AARP third grade reading program. And I see a bunch of some of my fellow members here tonight. And uh, Jerry Stabley is going to present the program and kind of an overview of this last year. Thank you, Jerry. Mayor, members of City Council, it's great to be with you this evening. Am I, uh, am I live? Okay, excellent. And uh, I'm actually just going to lead off the presentation. Uh, again, my name is Jerry Stabley, and I'm the chair of the program. And this is a chance for me to say thank you to, to the City of Casa Grande for, for supporting our program, for, for serving as our host, which means that you uh, provided us office space, uh, equipment, and staff oversight, which are greatly, greatly appreciated. The, the program would not have been possible without you, and we could not have asked for better partners than the City of Casa Grande and Casa Grande Elementary School District, especially in this critical first year. This year-old program, and we, we just started uh, tutoring in November, uh, in rural Arizona, and it's really the only program in the, in the United States that is a rural program, the next uh, larger one has a population of 400,000 people uh, in, it, it's in one city. Uh, is really serving as a model. What we keep hearing from our, our, our colleagues in AARP is that they're holding up this program as a model for, for the other programs, barring a lot of our, our good mm -hmm. ideas, and that's something that you should all be very, very proud of. And I also want to take this opportunity, while well, I've got the microphone, never give a planner a microphone, is to uh, take this opportunity to thank our volunteers. Uh, they've contributed, there's 60 of them, and they've contributed over 2,400 hours of their time uh, to this program, and we are very, very thankful. And again. The program would not have worked without them. Um, one of the things that I learned early on is to aim high. And we set a, 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 an audacious goal for this program. And our goal is to break the cycle of poverty and replace it with a cycle of prosperity. And we're doing this uh, one by one uh, with students on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, giving them the, the key to learning, which is, which is learning how to read. Um, and so we're focused on second and third graders because we know that uh, third graders are only 10 years away from, from the workplace. And that reading will be essential to employees in the future, especially to the, to the industries that we have coming to, to our community. Uh, from potato chips to microchips, people need ha have to know how to read, to reason, to be able to, uh, be able to fix and, and manage the machines that are going to be doing a lot of the work. So, at this point, let me turn it over to uh, Carol Chase, who's done a wonderful job as our program manager, and Amber Kent, who's going to kick it off, who, along with Stephen Weaver, have both been terrific to work with. So, Mayor, let me turn it all over to them, and at the end, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Thank you all. Thank you, Jerry. Hi. Hi, Amber. Some of my favorite stories start with once upon a time, and this <laughs> is going to be a great story. Um, we're far from the end, but I want to catch us up on where we are on our journey so far today. So to start us off, um, these are some of our uh, third graders passing their reading scores. And we have a video here from Heather. She's the one who works with the school district and works directly with Carol and myself, putting all this together and organizing all the volunteers and everything. So she wasn't here. She couldn't be here today. So hopefully we can get this video to play and she'll share her message virtually. Nope. <laughs> Can you push play? <laughs> there we go. Hi, I'm Heather Gonzalez, the Literacy Coordinator for the Casa Grande Elementary School District. And today I'm going to tell you why AARP Experience Core Tutoring is so important for our young readers. Over the past five years, our third grade reading scores have been stagnant. This standstill has been a huge eye opener to the need that we have um, to support our young readers with strong reading instruction, our foundational skills in reading, and helping our students transition from learning to read to reading to learn. 
As teachers, we wanna be able to support our students with all of the targeted supports that they need. And the AARP Experience Core Tutoring Program allows our students to work one-on-one -on -one with a caring community member in the area of reading fluency. With supports like these, we expect our students to show growth in a lot of areas like phonics, fluency, reading comprehension, vocabulary, and most importantly, their confidence in their views of themselves as a lifelong reader. We recognize the connections between third grade reading achievement, eighth grade promotion, high school graduation, and the building of a strong workforce in our community in the future. CGESD <coughs> schools appreciate the partnerships that we have with the city, Pinal Alliance, Achieve Pinal, and AARP. As you learn more about our program today, you'll hear a lot about the impact that this program has had on our students. Thank you. So you can see she said the scores are stagnant and they have remained about the same for several years. And that is a concern. So why focus on reading? This is a question that I could spend the next hour talking about, but I promise I'll keep it brief. Reading is something that as adults who have been reading for a long time, we tend to take for granted. When we see letters, our brain automatically changes it from squiggly lines to a word and to a sentence and to an idea. But for a reader who's just learning, it's a really complex process and it's difficult. And so when students, especially struggling students, are trying to learn to read, it can be very frustrating. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about why the third grade reading score is so important. But if you think about as they grow older, um, even as an adult, if you had a difficult time reading and understanding comprehension, how would you navigate the healthcare system? Or how would you apply for work? How would you find additional opportunities to do most anything? Reading is, is everywhere in our society. And in order to be self-sufficient, we need good readers. In addition to the benefits to the individual student, our community also benefits from this increased emphasis on reading and literacy. <coughs> our students who read um, by the time they finish third grade are more likely to graduate high school. They're also more likely to keep themselves out of trouble and find themselves on a successful path. They have better earning potential because they have opportunities for higher education and increased training. And they also have, in addition to you know, the increased potential for earnings, they have more choices that they can make. They can choose a career, explore different options so that they can choose something that is meaningful for them, and that in increases their quality of life. Our volunteers in this program are able to give back and find a renewed sense of purpose as they help these younger generations really find their love of reading and be successful as students. As a city, we want a more literate and engaged society, um, a, a community. Our residents who are readers, as studies have shown, that people who read and enjoy reading are more likely to attend events, they're more likely to volunteer, they're more likely to vote. All of those things that bring connectedness and togetherness in our community, all of that has to do with reading. And so it's really important to our city as a whole. This better educated workforce allows our city to attract new industries like Lucid because we can supply the workers that they need for those higher paying jobs that require good reading skills, and analysis. So it's not just being able to decipher words, but to internalize those and make critical decisions based on what you read. Even the manufacturing jobs that decades ago would have been done primarily with hard physical labor are going to require more technical expertise because the physical part of the work is going to be done more by technology and by machines. So as we support our students in literacy, we're preparing them to become part of those, those higher tech jobs that we want to come to Casa Grande. So statistics don't tell the whole story, but they do tell, they give us a snapshot of where we are and they can help us find our progress as we go along. So this is really the beginning snapshot. This is the latest um, data from Achieve or Expect More Arizona 
Uh, and it's from 2019 because the tests weren't done in 2020. So they have a statewide goal for reading at grade level at third grade of 72%. Right now our state is at 46%, Pinal County is at 37%, and Casa Grande is at 30%. And you can see, if you think back to that video that Heather shared, it has remained at 30% for several years in a row. If we want to make it to 72% by 2030, we've got to move. Something's got to change. And this is one way that we've invested really heavily into um, education and into literacy because it's super important. As students grow, a lot of the instruction that's given to them early on from kindergarten through third grade is how to read because it's complicated, it's complex. After third grade, you assume that they can read and you give them <coughs> more reading to learn their science and their math and their civics and everything else. So if they can't read, not only now are they behind in reading, but they're falling farther and farther behind in their other studies. And the reason that it's harder for them to catch up is because they continue to get frustrated and it's just harder and harder. So the earlier you can really tackle this problem, the better. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Carol and she's going to share our solution. Mayor, Council, it's been a long time. Yes, I've been before you guys. Feels good. Especially when I get to Last talk time to you I guys saw you was on a Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting good at Zoom. <laughs> All right. So the answer that we want to present today is the AARP Experience Core program. Um, as you can see, it started out as a two-year pilot program. And from what I understand, and Jerry can correct me if I'm wrong, it started about two years ago in planning process, yeah. give or take. So it took them a while to get this program to Casa Grant. But I think once we got here, considering we were in the middle of a pandemic, we did really, really awesome this year. Why is this program so easy to buy into? One, because it's been around for a long time. It started in 1995 with John Hopkins and Senior Leadership Corps. They're the ones that developed the program, put it into a pilot program, and continued it. AARP came on in um, 2011. It is a proven program. It's got evidence studies that show that tutors can make a difference in students' lives. It has a very well-developed curriculum. It's very easy to follow. And it's fun. The kids enjoy it. The seniors enjoy it. And they want to do it again. So it's been found that it can bring grade levels up about 1.5%. We use the A to Z reading curriculum to work with the kids. Each child gets their own book. Each tutor gets their own book. This year we sat across from screens with our kids. This summer we're sitting across from desks. We are working in the schools this summer. Um, we're going to serve about 30 students, third graders, with about 29 tutors. And we're going to do hybrid model as well. We're doing um, three schools that have in-person tutoring. And we're doing, Saguaro Elementary is allowing us to do a hybrid pilot because AARP hasn't really done anything like that yet. They just went all virtual last year. So we'll be one of the first schools that are doing in-person and hybrid virtual tutoring this summer. So we are kind of a, a pilot all the way around, if you want to think of it that way. <coughs> OK, come on. Arrow. All right, I didn't say I knew how to do computers. I just said I knew how to do Zoom. <laughs> there we go. All right, so the history of Experience Core, um, like I said, it started in 1995. Currently, it's operating in 23 cities in the United States. Um, we have three now here in Arizona. We have one in the city of Tempe, city of Phoenix. As you can see, they're a pretty well-developed program since 2006 and 2014. Now we have one in Casa Grande. Ours started June 2020. 
That means we began recruiting and training and getting everybody on board so that we could start tutoring in November of 2020. We were the first program in Arizona to start tutoring. City of Phoenix started after January 21. City of Tempe started in December. So we started before anybody else. We served three schools. We had 60 volunteers. And 94 kids came through our program. At the end of May, we um, were tutoring 72 students on a regular basis. So a few numbers from this year that I thought maybe you guys might be interested in. We had um, 36 weeks of tutoring program. 24 of those were um, with the schools. 12 weeks of training were spent by the volunteers getting ready for it and continuing training, ongoing training. We had 109 seniors apply for our program virtually. Everything was done virtually. Well, some of them printed up applications and put in hard copies. But most of it was virtual. We had 79 tutors that were background checked by the school district for us. Of that, 60 completed the whole year. So that's our tutors and our monitors. We worked with 11 classrooms in the district and 16 school district staff. We did, I'm gonna update Jerry's numbers a little bit because we've had a chance to compile all of our numbers. But the, the tutors put together a total of 3,507 volunteer hours for this first year. Of that, 1,727 was direct one-on-one -on -one tutoring with the students. And then 170 were prep hours for them and they spent 1,600 hours in training. So they took a lot of time. It was important to them. They attended a lot of Zoom meetings. They attended a lot of work sessions on the computer. Some of them came in person. We got to use the lab at Vista in our little social distancing capacity. But um, they spent a lot of time getting ready for this program. And like I said, now we're going to go on to summer. So now we have some statistics that we're going to run through um, through the end of the year. And I think Joette is going to come up and kind of explain. It was a very strange year because of the changeover in curriculum and the testing. Thank you. Mayor McFarland, city council members, first of all, I want to thank you for allowing us to come and present to you today. I also uh, just want to acknowledge that the work of these folks back here has been instrumental. Uh, the data that I'm going to share with you really does not come close to reflecting what our students have gained from this program. Uh, and before I start to talk a little bit about the data, I want to talk about the fact that the AARP Experience Core Reading Program really, for this year, this strange anomaly of a year, has promoted well-being and connectedness amongst our students, has provided personalized learning for our students, and has offered a routine that balances learning and play. Um, and although I won't say that our volunteers really played with our students, they were joyful with our students. They were encouraging with our students. They really helped our students feel at ease with this online hybrid type of a learning situation with strangers that they had never met in person. Imagine that. Um, so we had some strange test scores this year. One of the reasons that we had some strange test scores is because um, our students got a little bit of help from their parents at the beginning of the year taking the assessments, believe it or not. Um, we had parents calling us and say, I didn't quite 
know how to do this. And we kind of said, well, you're not supposed to do that. It was supposed to be the students who knew how to do that. Um, but we still do have some scores That's to funny. share with you. And you can see in this graph here that um, what we're looking at is third grade growth. And you can see the growth, steady growth throughout the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year in the yellow bar. That's awesome. We also have data by school, and you can see where we have more students behind. Um, again, these are third grade reading levels and students who are being placed at kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and or third grade. And I can tell you firsthand that poverty really does have a strong correlation between students' reading ability. And, um, what we're seeing in our schools at this point in time is students and parents are struggling with stamina in reading. Um, students aren't necessarily seeing their family members read books, read newspapers, read magazine articles. What students are seeing are families reading the thing that's in their hand. And we've got to be able to change that trajectory if we want to make a difference. Reading books, reading magazines, reading comic books, reading anything is really good for our students. Uh, you can also see um, same kind of trend at Evergreen with that uh, first grade placement being highest, right? So considering most of our third grade students are about two years below grade level. And then um, on this graph, you can see um, really strong phonological awareness. That's being able to hear the sounds that um, people are saying. Phonics uh, is pretty strong too, so they know their letter sounds and they know how to blend words. Uh, high frequency words is really pretty strong as well, but when you get into that vocabulary and comprehension, um, we're starting to see some weaknesses. And that, again, correlates largely to poverty because it's the language that's used at home. Um, and I'm not talking about Spanish or English. I'm talking about the level of uh, vocabulary that families are using around their children. It's the level of exposure that our children also have to um, ideas and things, trips to the zoo, trips to museums, trips to the farm, things that actually expand their vocabulary in numerous ways. And this is what we are battling in our schools. And we have to give them real life experiences in order to help them proceed. Who's doing this part? All right. What I do want to say is. We saw our largest gains with our students in the areas of vocabulary and comprehension. The ones who participated in this program had those one-on-one -on -one conversations with the adult volunteers, and we really saw a big difference there because of it. All right, so I've told you what a great program is. Now I'm gonna let our students and our tutors, all the pictures that you've seen in the slides tonight have been our program. So all of those have come from our program this year. So this is Mary Peoples working with, um, I think that's Luca that she's working with. And it's one of my readers started the pandemic with faulty equipment. She is now my most, um, oh, that's Bobby. Okay, so Bobby <laughs> Siebold and proficient reader. One of her readers had a little self-confidence but is now more confident. My most challenged reader wants to be the best reader in the world. And Shannon, with her reader, I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to help these kids during such a traumatic time. Reading brings a calmness to their hectic day, and I'm glad I can be part of their learning experience. And Ursula, a student was reading at low grade level one and was not at all confident. She has now re read about 13 books and has made great strides. She knows that with practice, she can read fluently. All right, so now I think this is a student one. Do you have it on the screen by any chance? Oh, here we go. Might have to click it one more. Oh, go back.
We're getting some new fiber soon. So. <laughs> My name is Amira, and one thing that my tutoring helped me was like when like I got stuck on a word, she like like said it like sounded out, and she also used to say it to me. And also her friend Carol used to like like when it was the end of my like tutoring day, uh, she said, "Good job! Like you're so good. When you get like a word right, go like yes." And like. She made me super happy when she said that, and when I saw her last time, I was super happy, and I gave her my cards. Aww. That's the My Red Evergreen. And And this is our reward. Um, these are the students at Cottonwood that presented us with all their red and pink hearts one day on the last day of tutoring, and like, Zamira so said all the kids from Evergreen gave us cards, so the tutors enjoyed it thoroughly. Next steps for the program, 21-22 school year, we're gonna expand from three schools to five schools. Um, we will continue at Saguaro, Cottonwood, and um, Evergreen, and then we will add Palo Verde and Mesquite this next year. We will also go from 90 kids to 200 is what we're hoping to serve next year. Um, and then for future, they are looking to open it up to other districts in Pinal County. And the, the gui funding guidelines are currently on the screen, as you can see. Um, the Pinal County, or not Pinal County, the Pinal Board has been working really dis diligently to come up with a process for other communities who are interested in bringing this program to their community. So for school district contribution, it could look like this, um, $125 per student in the program annually, about $3 per session, or two to 3,000 annually, depending on the size of their district. Um, they would help with recruitment of tutors in their area, although as we've proved, you don't have to live in the area if you do virtual tutoring. Um, provide computers and support for remote learning. Provide the reading test data. Um, and assist in providing some workspace. For the municipality or supervisory district contribution, it's about a $62 per student annual um, cost or half of the school district's contribution. Uh, we'd like them to become a member or make a contribution to Pinnell Alliance since that is the overall agency that is um, bringing all this together and then assist in providing workspace options for staff as well in their community. So that is our program. I wanted to let you know that we made a yearbook for our kids and our actually for the tutors this year. I sent you a link in your emails. So take a look at it. It's really a nice overview and snapshot of our first year together. And we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Mr. Powell. <clears throat> I. <clears throat> I love to read. I read about 60 books during the pandemic. <clears throat> read the paper every day. I want to go out there and get that newspaper and see what's happening. What, what I'm wondering, when I go to buy a new book, I usually buy my granddaughter one. And uh, she, she doesn't necessarily choose the book I want her to choose, but uh, try, to, try to get her uh, in a reading situation. But I guess what I'm wondering at the schools, is there books they can take out of the library there or do all of those stay on, oh, yeah. on site? No. I don't currently know about the library situation at the yes. school. Joetta can talk more about that one. I think Dr. Joetta I do can know that, that for question. our program, um, all of our children, when they finish their A to Z reader, they get to take those home. Okay. And then at the end of the year, our program also bought books for them to, and we gave them for over the summer reading. Because that's one of the challenges I've had is trying to decide what's a good book for her age group to read and, and uh. go ahead, Joetta. Mayor McFarland, uh, Council Member Powell. What I wanna say is um, our book, our book, our libraries are open okay. and students are allowed to check out books. We also had a book bus program, which would take, um, 
children ordered the book that they wanted from the library, and then the bus would take the books out to the children, which was really remarkable and was the brainchild of several of our librarians together. Um, then I also want to say, any book your granddaughter wants to read is a good book for her to read. If she's interested in it, she is going to be motivated to yeah. read it. And although we as parents and grandparents want to kind of steer our children, grandchildren, and whomever else into quality literature, um, I would say as long as she is reading, that is a really good thing. And one of the things that you might be surprised about too, I have two grandsons and they're both reading, ages three and seven. Uh, the three-year-old reads. Um, but comic books actually have a really high vocabulary level and they also have the picture text that go with it helps students gain uh, that vocabulary and comprehension that they need. Mm -hmm. Graphic novels, uh, a lot of times parents try to steer, steer their children away from graphic novels. I say let them read graphic novels. It really does have a high readability and it's very high interest. I was wondering where I got my literacy from. I know it's from comic books. <laughs> comic books? <laughs> Archie. I'm going to go with Archie, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Well, I, I just, I, I think it's been a, a real hard, hard year for teachers, for teaching, for schools, for the whole thing, for the kids that had to learn on the air and uh, didn't have the in-class uh, opportunity to be there so whatever we can do we need to do to try to catch them up and get them back on grade level again and uh, I hope that that's what we achieve. Lisa? You know and I know you mentioned that there's a couple programs through the state and I just wanted to thank all of you and I know Judy's back there and yep. um, Bob Jackson and, and Jerry I know you guys have been part of this from the beginning and so it's easy to just say oh we're starting it up in cash grant but it takes a lot of time and commitment and you guys have been behind this program for you know the last couple of years pushing it through and getting funding and support so I really appreciate it and it is so important you know there's some great programs in the community the Dolly Parton um, literacy program you know United Way and Child and Family Resources are really pushing the early childhood literacy and so that's critical too and I hope you know you guys maybe work with some of these other programs to see how you can piggyback with each other um, but there, there there's some great early childhood which it starts when they're little babies reading books you talk Amber about books and how important it is it's so important for little even little babies um, to to hear those words and pictures and everything so again I know how critical it is and I, I really thank all of you for really sticking with this and taking an initiative and growing the program so thank you Donna uh, you know and I just want to say a couple of things first of all uh, to Jerry and especially Carol I know that you know when Mike and I supported this program I was really encouraged because you always kept us up to date you always sent you know something to tell us where you were at what you were doing and that kind of encouraged the second thing I, and I think it was Carol that brought it up when you narrowed down how much it cost per student I mean when you think about $62 a student you know I mean how many people can say you know I can give up couple trips to Starbucks and I'm gonna sponsor a student this year so yes. that's my challenge to our community as we look forward to the next school year it's gonna be critical and I think that that's a great campaign that we can look at instead of a, a large number for our community to be able to every business in town to sponsor one student just think how many people we could serve so thank you all very much and I just want to say to that you know actually this this really was initiated probably five years ago, four years ago, when Bob and I were sitting around the table trying to decide who was gonna run for mayor, take his place. So and I wanna call Bob out, our, our past mayor so, and, and his wife, Judy. But we were sitting around a table and then we kind of got this idea of, of having an education and workforce development piece. And then that kind of spun off into, into working with Pinal Alliance and set up the sidebar, which was Achieve Pinal. And the Achieve Banal had a, a very broad uh, goal with, through trying to train kids, get them ready for, for uh, jobs. And then also, then Jerry came up with his experience through the, uh, the uh, AARP program up in Phoenix, or Tempe. And then we kind of married the two together and it really has blossomed into an amazing 
uh, an amazing project, and, and I'm so proud of all of you because uh, it really, I, I believe it will make a difference. You know, and Amber for your leadership, you know, uh, at the libraries, and, and Jerry obviously carrying the torch, and Carol for all your hard work. Uh, you know, and Joetta Jackson, Joetta Jackson, Joetta Gonzalez, <laughs> Dr. Gonzalez for, for your, your efforts and, and help through the elementary school district. And of course, Judy and Bob, uh, you guys have done a phenomenal job. So thank you. Does anybody else have any other comments? Matt? I don't want to belabor it, but thank you all. And I love seeing the kids. You could tell just by the, especially the one little girl who didn't have her mask on, just how happy she was. <laughs> and it's all about paying attention, just giving those kids a little bit and you, priceless for our, uh, I like how you t tied it into our whole community too, about having better readers is gonna build this community from the ground up, you know, with all the jobs coming to town. So thank you all very much. Yeah, great, great work. Any other comments? I just wanna say the positive I have. It also helps keep our seniors involved and connected to our community as well. Yep, absolutely. So. It was, they probably got more out of it than the kids did this year. Because a lot of them didn't go anywhere and didn't yeah. see anybody and they made all new friends on Zoom. They got to learn how to Zoom with their kids. I was, I was at the graduation party, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, they are, they're quite the crew, huh? <laughs> so, like it says, reading is the key to learning, so. Did the mayor graduate? I'm just curious. He uh, did, oh, top good. of the class. They gave, they gave me an honorary. <laughs> <laughs> so, and if any of you are interested, we are recruiting for next year, so we'll take an hour out of your time and reply online. I think you might meet the age requirements, some of you might, <laughs> maybe. What? Not you, Matt. If you make the age requirements, <laughs> come join us. We have right. a lot of fun. Thank you, Carol. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're, Amber, we're using some of the, our recruiting for a mayor's reading program to kind of work and get some of those volunteers to add. Yeah, okay, great. Good, thank you. All right. Well, that was, that's, I, I love that program. It's near and dear to my heart, so I appreciate your guys' update, so thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is the uh, Public Safety Personnel Retirement, or affectionately known as PSPRS. And um, your report for tonight, Scott? Yep. Oh, Larry, you're gonna set this up, sorry. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, if I can spend just a few minutes before I ask Mr. Barber to come up and continue in the presentation. Uh, this is obviously a continuation to a study session on the public safety retirement uh, and more specifically the unfunded liability that we're faced with here at the city of Casa Grande. And, and I know that Mr. Barber had provided the mayor and council with a, a fair number of, of, of information and facts at the, at the uh, study session that we held in March. Following that particular council meeting, staff walked away uh, from that meeting with some guidance re related to moving forward with potential options to find resolve to our unfunded liability. And, uh, and took what I consider to be three primary components away from the feedback that we had received uh, from the Mayor and Council. Those including, uh, besides finding the resolve to, to our unfunded liability, finding a mechanism as part, of this, as part of this plan and recommendation that would potentially bring some level of cash that the city would, would make, contribution the city would make towards the resolve. And uh, lastly, the issue of funding some type of a contingency uh, for the uncertainties that may, may come uh, into the system in the future years. And so we left that meeting and assembled a team, a finance team that is a very capable team uh, uh, through uh, partnerships with uh, Piper Sandler and Stifle. And tonight you're going to get the opportunity to meet a couple of the managing directors from both of those organizations, both of the individuals, Mr. Nick Dodd and Mr. Mark Reeder, I've worked with, the city's worked with on uh, a number of, of uh, financial uh, bond deals in the past. And uh, two of the uh, more qualified individuals uh, in the in the state, and we actually uh, got an opportunity to meet a couple of the Stifle uh, representatives, uh, Mr. Omar Dagestani and Rushta Mustafa, that w that we've never worked with b before. But because of the 
uh, uniqueness of these uh, public safety, these pension bonds. These, uh, ultimately, they assembled a team and uh, through a course of a number of weeks of meetings with, with our team, myself, Mr. Barber, um, Stephen, and Angel, we believe that we're bringing what I consider to be a very solid recommendation to the mayor and council this evening. We're going to talk about that recommendation. We're going to talk a little bit about the timeline uh, and look for council's uh, direction this evening to, to proceed. But, uh, but ultimately, I, as we go through the slides, I, I believe the council will see, our taxpayers will see that the proposal is one that meets the, the goals of the mayor and council, as well as has the potential of saving our taxpayers a considerable amount of money over the amortized life of, of these unfunded liabilities that we face with both police and fire pensions. And so with that, I'm gonna ask Mr. Barber to, to pick up here and, and uh, we are trying some new technology tonight, just so the council is aware, you only see two representatives here from our financial team. We've got a couple of folks on the line on Zoom, and uh, they are actually managing the slideshow. And so um, we'll proceed with extreme caution, but hopefully we'll move, we'll be able to move forward in the next hour. So Scott. Hey McFarland, members of the council, as Larry indicated, it was three months ago on March the 1st, that I stood in this very place and study session to talk to you about this issue of unfunded liability, legacy liability, as it were, in the public safety personnel retirement system. And I explained at that time there were 260 odd individual systems that make up PSPRS, unlike the Arizona State Retirement System. And every system stands on its own and is evaluated from an actuary basis every year. And the rates that the employers pay are set by the actuarial studies. And it's basically the unfunded actuarial liability that we're talking about. This is debt from our pension plans and police and fire departments, and it's just that. It is debt. It must be shown on our annual financial statements, and ultimately, it has to be paid. And the bottom line, why is that in order for us to provide pension benefits to retirees that have been promised in our department, pub public safety departments? So we're currently paying that unfunded liability through the employer contributions that we pay for each employee enrolled in PSPRS every payday. And so that's how that's being financed right now within the public safety personnel retirement system. But in March, we told you about an approach to finance that debt outside of the public safety personnel retirement system, which presents an opportunity for us to achieve 100% funding ratio in both of our plans and also to potentially realize savings in interest paid and associated operational savings each year in our departmental budgets as well. Since the time of my presentation, several other governmental entities have joined the ranks of those taking an alternate approach to this debt payment. I think it's up to about 15 or 16. And others like we are making plans right now to, to join that group as well. Based on the March presentation, as Larry indicated, we moved forward and assembled a team to develop an approach and the detailed information that you're going to see and hear in the next hour or so. Uh, our, our two main contacts are here, as Larry already introduced, uh, induced them, Mark Reeder from Seafield Public Finance and Nick Dodd from Piper Sandler. And uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Nick, who's going to take us through the first group of slides. Do you want to start on page four, Nick? Pa page three. Three. Thank you, Thank Janae. You. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it's a pleasure to be here this evening um, and to present uh, to you on this matter. Before we get into the slides, uh, in the appendix, and I think in your presentation, we did have a glossary of key terms. There's a bunch of acronyms, and so hopefully that's helpful. And as we have the conversation this evening, if you need to refer to that, it is the first page in the appendix, just as, a, as kind of a refresher. Or you as don't have to use an acronym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we're here to talk about the pension and the UAL that the city has. And as a reminder, as, as, as Scott mentioned, you know, it's a debt that the city has. You noted in your financial savings every year. And um, the city of Casa Grande, when you look at your combined pension liabilities and your funding levels, you can see the police is currently funded at roughly 43%. Uh, fire is funded at 57, 53.7, uh, and and when you look at PSPRS in total, they're funded at approximately 46%. 
So, so your funding levels are, are, are frankly in line with where a lot of people are currently at. Um, and, and so I guess you've got good company if nothing else. Um, and the other thing I think to keep in mind is this liability that's outstanding accrues essentially at 7.3%. The actuarials determine that. Um, it's applied to everybody in the system at that same level. And obviously, um, what's going on right now in the current economy and the interest rate market is interest rates are very low. And so a number of municipalities, uh, both in Arizona um, and but also around the country are looking at alternative funding strategies as a result of that low interest rate environment. Um, I think here locally in Arizona, PSPRS has become much more engaged in this discussion. They've become much more active in reaching out to, to communities and trying to help identify solutions. Um, and, and so I think it's, there's a series of factors that kind of bring us to where we are at tonight. Um, if we could turn to the next page. So now we're gonna look specifically at, at your, your funded levels or unfunded levels. Um, as you know from reading your financials or from reading the report from PSPRS specific to the city, um, your liability is approximately $55.5 million on a combined basis. As we talk tonight about the opportunities, um, one of the things we're very aware of and want to make sure is that when we get to the end of the line, if the city does pursue this strategy, that you are fully funded and that you don't wake up the next day or a month down the road and you're in the hole again. That would not feel good. You would probably ask us to come back and explain how we ended up in that situation so soon. And so there's a couple things we're gonna talk about tonight. And the first is making sure we've identified the actual liability that's outstanding. Recognizing the report from PSPRS um, is almost a year old at this point. And that $55 million liability has been accruing at 7.3%. And so really it's a timing issue that when we talk about what would you, how would you size a potential bond issue, we have to recognize that there is frankly some uh, unrecognized uh, UAL that's not been factored in just because of the timing of when those reports are issued. And so we've tried to break out for you, starting on the left, um, what, what you would see in your report, what you would see in the financial statements of the city. And then we've, as you move to the right, we've identified kind of through the, you know, um, actuarial year that's about to end. And then also because we don't expect to close the bond issue on, you know, July 1st in, in a month, it's, it'll probably be a couple months after that. So there is still a few months in the new year that w the new, you know, actuarial year that we wanted to try and identify uh, what we think that would be. And so when you add up those three numbers, you can see, and, and in the numbers that will be presented in the presentation throughout the book, we're really talking about a, a roughly $62.5 million dollar million dollar liability and I just we wanted to make it clear you know when you compare the reports and and what would have been in the city's CAFR for 2020 and when you see the numbers in the book why there's a difference there um, I'd also note just on this page to give you some context um, you've read and heard about the 7.3 that uh, PSPRS you know uh, charges uh, the current interest rate environment and, and the numbers that are reflected in this presentation today are assumed to be about 2.65%. And so it's pretty amazing if you think about it, it's, it's almost two thirds lower. Um, it's, it's really pretty remarkable um, where interest rates are. So if we could turn to the next page uh, now, please. The city manager mentioned this as one of kind of the directives they felt that they were given from your March presentation, which was, it's not just about the liability, but it's also about how do we establish reserves to kind of give yourself some cushion uh, with regards to, you know, changes in the system, assumptions that change, unknowns that happen, and, and also to address that as we move forward. And we think that's very smart public policy. Uh, almost all of the issuers who have, have pursued this strategy in, in the state of Arizona, which is where we're most familiar, have also pursued some type of reserve strategy. 
I would say after that, there's a variation of what people do. Some folks have actually rolled it into the bond. Others have used cash reserves. Others have strategy to, uh, from the savings that they recognize between what they would have paid and what they are gonna pay with the bond to build up that reserve over a, a several year period of time. So I think that's where you have some flexibility and, and each jurisdiction has taken what they believe to be the best path for their community. But without a question, we believe there should be a, we, we refer to it as a contingency reserve or a, a CRF, um, and, and that it's really a critical part to the strategy. When we talk to the rating agencies who will rate these bonds, um, it will be a key um, factor that they'll want to see, that, that there's a recognition that we need to have this reserve fund. Uh, in case there are changes in the future. And so um, for the city of Casa Grande, uh, as staffs worked through the presentations and had their discussions internally, their recommendation is to fund that reserve not from bond proceeds, but in fact to use some of your, your existing cash reserves and designate them as a reserve for the, um, you know, the credit, the reserve for the, the pension liability, so it'd be set aside and designated as a potential you know, fund that could be used in the future if there was an unfunded liability again. Turning to the next page, page six, um, this is kind of getting into the policy a little bit about, about the reserve and why, um, you know, Obviously, the city, when it's all said and done, has the flexibility to establish the policies around this. This was our recommendation based on best practices and things we've seen. It, it really governs how you size it. Um, and, and I will tell you that um, in the appendix behind the, um, the glossary of terms, there is a very specific calculation of how we went about calculating that reserve and so that is there as kind of backup behind it and there's two different methodologies that we look at when we when we factor into how to size the reserve um, you know in in total if we can turn to the next page you'll you'll see that um, in, in total the the recommended reserve sizing would be 5.2 million and and you can see that for each of the systems, um, and this is where the detailed analysis that's in the appendix, if you're interested in really understanding those numbers, uh, how they're calculated, but at a high level, we look at both assumptions on loss in investments, uh, because these bond proceeds will be given to PSPRS, they will invest them like they do all of their funds, and some years like this last year will go great and they've had a phenomenal year, and other years, sometimes investments lose money or they have bad years, and so the first part of the kind of the testing we do to size the reserve relates to you know, market losses, and we essentially assume a 20% loss. Uh, the second is something that's um, not really in your control, either which is changes to the actuarial assumptions. Those are held at PSPRS at the plan level. Um, th they probably will make some changes to some of their assumptions during the time period which this debt's outstanding. And, and so part of the reserve is established to try and protect the city against changes in some of the assumptions related to the actuarial analysis which they do every year. And so it's really those two strategies for both the police and the fire that we apply and came up with the 5.2 million. Turning to the next page, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Omar, who's um, online here. Um, you'll see that um, this, really I think the, the options for the city are you could do nothing and continue to do pay as you go which is what you've been doing really for a number of years and what some cities are continuing to do, or the recommendation to um, the council this evening and that we've put forward in the book is that you would fully fund the, the, unam the UAL of the city. Uh, we would include in that the unrecognized loss, so you'd be at the 62.5 million, and that you would use cash reserves to fund the reserve. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Omar. He's gonna go into details on the, the various scenarios that you know, show the sizing. 
Hey, thanks very much, Nick. And thank you, Mayor McFarland, City Council, Manager Reigns, Mr. Weaver, and Ms. Hazelman. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I actually had the, the chance to visit Casa Grande um, about a, was it a week or a week and a half ago. Uh, and and you, have, you have a really beautiful community. And, and I think that obviously came out in the discussion uh, around the uh, literacy program this evening. What a fantastic program. Kudos to you. Um, I, I feel it, it's a hard act to follow uh, and so glad to see that. Um, considering uh, your options here, and we could, uh, Janae, if we go to the next slide, and I'm joined uh, here today uh, by my colleagues, Janae Booker and Rishta Mustafa. Um, when we put all of this together, we look at uh, scenario one, which is the staff recommended scenario, uh, which as Nick had indicated, includes a um, cash funded contingency reserve fund, which will help you buffet against uh, year to year volatility, both with, with, with respect to investment returns, as well as with respect to uh, actuarial uh, changes, which, which we all know, uh, not only from PSPRS, but from pension funds nationally, um, you know, there can be changes year to year in your number. Um, the structure we put forward here, uh, you will see uh, three important things. Uh, and uh, if you look at the red line, that is the, the graph of the UAL payment associated with your tier one and tier two liability for your PSPRS liabilities. Um, the blue bars are what the proposed debt service will be uh, should you decide to move forward with this. And the green, uh, as, as you might expect, is uh, actually expected savings uh, should all of the things in the report hold true. Now, uh, if we're to consider this, um, you know, you take a liability that, um, you know, this is a, a $63 million bond issue. Uh, and on that borrowing for money that you already owe, as, um, as Mr. Weaver and Mr. Baines had uh, shared earlier, um, you're going to be able to save on a present value basis, on an expected basis, uh, over $33.5 million. I'll repeat that again, $33.5 million or 53% of the size of this liability. Um, naturally, uh, as we'd indicated earlier, um, you know, this is something that uh, a number of communities have done. I personally had the chance in Arizona to work uh, with, I believe, 14. Actually, I've worked with all 15 of 15 issues, as has Mr. Reeder uh, and Ms. Mustafa and Ms. Booker. Um, and I know uh, Nick's firm has worked with several as well, uh, many of them. And so, uh, you know, this is something that, that is very uh, timely in Arizona. It's also something that, uh, very frankly, uh, we see happening nationally. Uh, we're a part of transactions literally from coast to coast um, because of the low rates. Specifically, you know, if, if you were to come to market in today's market, uh, we would estimate your interest rate or your borrowing cost would be about 2.65%. Um, we can advance the next page, and I know it's a little bit difficult by Zoom ask questions, um, but if there are questions, please, please uh, jump in. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not shy, and I know uh, Nick is not either. Um, and so I will ask for Mark and Nick to interrupt if there are things that people want to raise or questions. Hearing none, uh, and hoping that people didn't uh, fall asleep already, um, page 10 uh, shows uh, shows the same information that we'd had in graphical format in, in a tabular form. And specifically, again, a, column A are the unfunded liability payments as put forward by PSPRS. Those are payments that are going to be made should you decide not to do anything. The debt service is column B, and the projected cash flow benefit um, totals in column C um, is you subtract one from the other. Now you'll notice there's a third column because if you total up column C, you get to 43 million point nine. We don't share that as the expected savings because it, you know, it's not apples to apples because it uh, doesn't bring all the dollars into the present, which is the final calculation we do in the final column of this table. We can move to the next page. Thank you, Janae. So 
Um, there, there are, of course, other scenarios to be considered. Um, one of them is, um, you know, a pay, a pay as you go scenario. And, um, you know, this is essentially PSPRS borrowing from, uh, or excuse me, the city borrowing from PSPRS uh, to support its funding costs. And, uh, you know, as we've seen by virtue of not having this funded, uh, you know, every dollar that is unfunded, all 63 million is essentially a debt that, um, that the city has to PSPRS uh, that has an interest rate of 7.3%. Jenny, we'll go to the next page, please. So um, again, I think I'd alluded to this earlier in terms of the number of people um, that have actually completed uh, these PSPRS for fundings. Um, and you'll notice the, the first one was the city of Flagstaff uh, that, that we uh, worked on last July. Um, and, and uh, you know, we've, uh, as, as recently as last week, we priced, um, we priced a couple more, uh, the city of Kingman, as well as the city of Cottonwood. Uh, this week we have the city of Douglas coming to market. Um, and is, you know, obviously these have all been really well received and well um, regarded in the market. Uh, I, I would stop as an aside there, um, considering the very conservative structures that, that we've recommended and um, that, that, you know, that your, uh, your, your management has proposed, here, um, we anticipate that your issue would be very well received by the market, um, both from a rating perspective as well as a, a pricing perspective. Um, and so, you know, uh, you'd look very good on this list. Um, the next page, please, Janae. Um, now, I always like to be very direct. Um, in my career, I, I lead our national pension practice. I've personally worked on 19 billion of these financings over my over the last 19 years, um, and um, I, I like to be very direct with people because um, I just think that's a better way to live. And uh, I still have a nine-year-old son, and uh, I'll be doing this for a while. So I'd, I'd like you to all be happy with what we do. Um, some of the key risks: um, market risk, investment return. That's the obvious one, right? Um, you know, there have been a lot of changes that have occurred at PSPRS relative to how uh, investments are managed, uh, and, you know, that, that offers great promise. Nonetheless, by entering a pension obligation bond, um, you know, if, if, you, um, if PSPRS earns less than 7.3%, the expected savings could be lower. Uh, and if they earn less than your borrowing rate, in this example of 2.65%, Every year for the next 17 years, um, if they earn exactly the 2.65%, you'd be indifferent, right? Now, that hasn't occurred at any 20-year uh, point in over history, but nothing to say that it couldn't. Um, probably pretty unlikely, but it is a risk. Um, and naturally, if, if you're to earn less than that uh, over a sustained period of time, uh, you'd be worse off for having done this. Actual risk, we talked a little bit about um, things like mortality tables. Um, great news over the, the past 19 years that I've been doing this, uh, people are living longer. We have better health care. Um, that's wonderful for all of us in society. It's lousy for pension math, uh, and it keeps up, um, pushing the unfunded liabilities up for systems nationally. Finally, um, you know, the funding rate targets, um, given that all of these actuarial numbers can move around a bit, uh, over time, there is always the risk if you're trying to get exactly to 100 that you can be slightly over or slightly under, H hence the reason that we took the market-based UAL approach uh, to try to lessen that risk. Um, so um, I'd like to just stop here again and see uh, from Mark or Nick if there are questions from the mayor or the city council. Mr. Lavender? I'm assuming this would... Uh Money be coming out of the secondary tax rate for uh, the citizens to pay. Am I correct, Larry? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lavender, the this particular uh, recommendation is that is to actually fund these as a pledged revenue obligation, which would which be would we would be pledging our excise tax, and so it would not be 
uh, a, a debt that we would service through our secondary tax. from a matter of practicality, and I'll let Nick or Mark opine more if, if needed, essentially what this proposal does is takes the money that we're paying annually to, to the pension and essentially replaces it with a debt payment and results in some level of savings annually. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, if I could, um, the city has used pledged revenue or, or excise tax debt for mm -hmm decades right. um, many cities in Arizona it's actually the the primary way a lot of cities will fund if you don't want to go to the voters and ask for secondary property taxes um, you operate on on sales tax both your local and the state shared and for certain projects that you deem a priority you'll borrow and pay the debt versus paying for it on an ongoing basis and so um, on just as a matter of, you, you, if you looked at the list of cities who have done financings, there was two or three that did certificates of participation. They were all charter cities and had a, a specific charter prohibition against pledging sales taxes. Um, otherwise, there's stats, Arizona state law allows for Arizona municipalities to pledge through a lease structure the sales tax to the repayment of the debt. I want to get Pima County's rate, <laughs> two point oh eight five. Yeah. Can you work on that one? A plus, double yeah. A plus. Does anybody else? Oh, Matt, go ahead. Tax. I'm sorry. Isn't there a few cities in the state that have actually raised their their sales tax just to pay the pension liabilities? And where we're taking money that we already have, we're just going to save that money, right? Well, they actually put it on their property tax. I think that no, I was think someone raised sales tax. Too. Sales tax. Was, I know. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, C city of Prescott, yeah, Prescott actually had a specific, um, they did take it to the voters, but it was a specific sales tax. Okay. It's 100% dedicated to the prepayment to the of this PSPRS liability. Once the liability goes away, the tax goes away. And so from their perspective, th th they said, that's how we're going to pay it. and and. Frankly, they took it to the voters the first time and it didn't pass. And they started closing parks and libraries and the voters said, wait, why are you closing parks and libraries? And they, the elected officials said, we told you we were gonna close parks and libraries if you didn't, we have this big liability. And you probably remember from the fire and they have some unique issues in Prescott and had a really outsized liability relative to the size of their community. And so that was how they ended up doing it. Go ahead, Bob. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I'm understanding this recommended reserve. It, it, is that uh, something that we establish either actual money or a plan to uh, so that the lender will be favorable as far as terms and, and interest rate? So it'll, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, um, so you will actually, the, the recommendation being brought forward is that right now you have uh, surplus revenues or reserves on, in your balance sheet or in your bank account, and you would actually designate the 5.2 million as being dedicated towards the pension uh, credit reserve fund, as opposed to um, you could borrow $67 million versus the 62, you'd pay the interest on that $5 million. So staff's desire and recommendation is to actually designate a portion of your existing cash reserves as the reserve fund and if if staff and is willing to say that in a rating meeting with the rating agencies they will in fact give you credit for that versus going out to bond for it okay and that reserve is that solely to show that we can make the payments on this bond because no. where, and where I'm going is my my biggest fear, and I'm all in favor of this. I, I that's no secret. But um, my biggest fear is five or ten years down the road that we w we may have built up uh, another chunk of unfunded liability, and and essentially be right back where we started. And I didn't know if this reserve was uh, to to pay that down on an annual basis if if that happens or. Exactly how that works, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mr. Council, Mr. Mayor, all, 
I just wanted to speak to one thing real quick, and then I'll let Omar speak to the reserve. Um, on, on the issue of the credit and the ability to pay, what the town, the city would be doing is actually pledging both your local and the state shared revenues towards the repayment of the debt. And um, the city currently has three sales tax bonds outstanding. And those existing documents have covenants in them that spell out the metrics under which you can sell additional debt and also the metrics under which you have to manage your, your finances. And if in the future your revenues got to a point where they weren't at a certain ratio above your debt service, you would actually have to raise your sales tax to a level to, to meet those payments. And so for the city, your revenues have to exceed your debt service by three times. You guys don't have a lot of debt. Your revenues currently exceed your debt service by like 12 or 13 times. And, and, and so th the issue with regards to the ability to pay is really embedded in the legal documents. And the credit rating agencies also do, though, look at those factors when they rate your bonds. And then, Omar, I'll let you speak to the question of the reserve and the purpose of it. Thank, thank you, Nick. Uh, Mayor McFarland, members of the council. Um, the, the, exact, the exact fear that you have around you know a new liability building up over time is exactly why we recommend the contingency reserve fund right. it is not pledged for uh, bondholders it is not something that uh, is available to them um, you know i think they like it because they know that it promotes stability on your side but it certainly does not uh, directly improve the security interest that they hold in the bond um, what it does do, though, is buff it against, you know, we talked about market risk, right? You know, those sort of, if there were a 2008 event to occur, it would help you smooth that out. The other thing, frankly, you know, people always worry about market risk like 2008. Uh, although if you look at 2008, most people, most of the funds uh, saw those returns uh, come back over time. The bigger risk, and frankly, the harder one to dig out of, is actuarial risk. Um, uh, you know, there's um, every time your actuary comes to, to update your tables and your assumptions, it's, it's almost never to the better of the unfunded liability. It almost always increases it, largely, again, due to things around increased life expectancy uh, and the like. Um, and so in that, in that stead, the contingency reserve fund allows this to be, uh, rather than a one-time plug to fix the transact, to fix the liability, it is really intended to give the city of Casa Grande, Grande uh, a long-term tool to manage it, uh, to manage it efficiently. And I would share uh, one of the first transactions I worked on uh, when I was still a young man uh, was the state of Wisconsin. And uh, you will observe they use several reserve funds similar to what we propose here. You will observe that they are still fully funded. Thank you. Um Mr. Raines, so I'm understanding that on an annual basis, if we had to, we could dip into that 5.2 million to catch ourselves up if, if there was a negative return from PSPRS? Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, uh, um, Councilman Huddleston, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you what I believe my answer is, and I want Omar to quickly correct me if, if I'm wrong. My understanding is that, that really this reserve achieves two key elements. Number one is that it does look very good to the bond rating agencies, which ultimately will impact our, our interest rate. And number two, it serves as a, a reserve and a contingency should market conditions change and that we ultimately need to utilize that annually uh, to, to deal with perhaps a rising increase because of the market conditions to PSPRS that we could use this reserve to stabilize that. And Larry, I think also was also to at council's request, there was a, a request that we'd look at using some of our reserves to help this problem. So it, it's an addition to that as well. And and I would just making that statement to the council member. I want to make sure that our financial team is in agreement with my reading of that. Yes, I'm in entire agreement. I, I think that's a perfect description. Thank you. Matt, go ahead. 
I just want to give my disclaimer too, so everybody knows that this is managed by the state and we're required to participate. Right. This is not the city managing the PSPRS. Um, but the other thing in all seriousness is, you know, like the past year when we set our, our property tax rate and we had, you know, some that was not pledged and we pledged it towards this PSPRS, can we still continue to do something like that in the future to pay this down even faster and save more money? Or would this just be it and we wouldn't do that? Or would we need that for other projects? I, th I think the short, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Herman, uh, I, I believe from my, my chair today that the short answer to that is that given the amount of potential operational and capital needs that we would need in the general fund, uh, and, and, we'll, and we'll talk a little more about the structuring, uh, my sense is, is that, the, that the monies that we would have one time allocated to, to pay the pensions will likely be utilized in our them. operational budgets and or capital budgets. And, and, and quite frankly, that's part of the recommendation that we're making this evening is to preserve some flexibility for our organization should we continue to see the, the type of uh, demand, uh, growth demands that's been transpiring that will and ultimately allowing us some flexibilities to manage that annually within our annual budgets. We'll also manage our, our bond capacity, right? Right. Mr. Powell. Do you function in the inflationary uh, <clears throat> component that looks ahead of us? We're seeing a lot of things happen that way. I remember several years ago we went through that when I was on the council and it just seemed like we never had any money. Mm -hmm. And we were in, in, uh, in jeopardy. And uh, I'm just wondering as we're doing this figuring, are we looking at uh, Biden's plan to raise taxes and to do the different things that he's got in place. And, and uh, we're seeing inflationary pricing right now happen. So uh, how that affects uh, our chance with, with, uh, with trying to put money aside or whatever, uh, we, we need to consider that, I assume. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, a um, couple things, the, the bonds, would be fixed rates so your payments would be fixed and if inflation goes crazy and interest rates skyrocket based on today's numbers your rates would stay at 2.65 percent so on that side once the bonds are priced you're locked in and, and the structure's done it's done obviously to the extent there's inflationary pressures and other things in the economy and on a national level you would really have to think about it in the context of how does that affect PSPRS. Right. Um, and obviously, we've tried to, as we've sized the bond issue and thought about the reserve fund factor in the fact that there could be some changes in those uh, over time. But as we're sitting here today, that's probably about the best we can do. Right. Anyone else have any other questions? Mayor. Bob. From from an actuarial standpoint, and, I, and this first one is a question, but did, didn't in the last few years PSPRS go from 20 to 25 year retirement? So, yeah, maybe Scott. As part of the reform efforts that were achieved through legislation and through the voters' approval in the state of Arizona, a new tier was created. Right for the, the, all of those coming in to public safety retirement. And so all of those rules are very different. So the bleeding, as it were, was, was stopped in relationship to everybody coming on board so that the pension liability under tiers one and two becomes, becomes a finite liability. Uh, so the, you're specifically speaking of some, some, uh, some additional adjustments that were made. And, uh, and, and, and Councilman Housen, I don't recall exactly that, that that happened that way because uh, it was involved with uh, the, the, the pension, the PSPRS folks did all they could from a legislative perspective and they actually went uh, over, over too far actually and there was litigation and so we had to come back on the Hall and Parker case and refund a bunch of, a bunch of contributions. So the eligibility, uh, the eligibility issues uh, may have changed but the, everything is accounted for in the actuarial studies every year. But a, but a police officer or firefighter hired today, are they under the second tier that they'll, they're entitled to a 25-year retirement? No, they're actually under tier three. They have an opportunity to choose 
between a defined benefit or a defined contribution plan, and they're under, the, under totally new rules. So tier one and two, tier two, uh, or the, the, what you're under and what others were. So everybody that came on board from, help me out, Chief, uh, it was like uh, <laughs> 20, 7120, 7119 is under, under tier three. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and, and just, just to build on that, I think it's important for the council to recognize we're still going to have a public safety uh, a contribution that the, that we have to make every year that we have to meet. What we're focused on this evening is the unfunded portions for the tier one and tier two uh, individuals that are in those first two tiers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Council? Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Omar. Mr. Mr. Mayor, we still have a, a. We want to talk. Mark, did you want to talk a little bit about the the timing of the the proposal? Or okay. Janine, if you move to page 14 or 15. Okay. There you go. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, so this is a very high level uh, calendar. Um, frankly, if, if the direction is to move forward, a bunch of emails and documents will start flying around in the coming weeks. Um, but high level, the kind of next step would be we would come back to this agency in in July for a formal approval of the resolution and all of the legal documents and between now and then the attorneys will get busy drafting we'll go through the credit rating process uh, if approved and and we decide to move forward we would look to price the bonds or lock in that interest rate in early August and and that's really for from your perspective that at that point you've shifted the risk to the investors and then we would look to fund and close by around September 1st and and it would be on that date you would we would close the bond issue and you would immediately transfer the funds uh, to PSPRS um, just as a practical matter it takes them about one pay cycle to recognize that um, UAL being fully funded so depending on when you hit it um, you might have one pay period where you would still have the UAL component and then they literally they shut it off and you just have the normal contributions which you know are paid every two weeks with part of your payroll so high level that's the the time frame we're looking at moving forward and like I said the the documents would start being prepared by the attorneys in the coming weeks and we'd be back here on July 19th. And so Mr. Mayor and members of the council, if I can just summarize some of the comments that have been made this evening and uh, through a few closing comments. Uh, the, first, the first point that I wanna make clear to the mayor and council and to the taxpayers is that we are not proposing any type of a tax increase with this proposal. In fact, as I've pointed out, we have the ability Essentially, due to the current market conditions, we're paying 7.3% to PSPRS annually. We're anticipating somewhere in the vicinity of 2.65 um, uh, is what we would, we would be paying to, to bondholders. We're taking advantage of that, which essentially will net out to, if you look over the amortized life of our pensions, 17 and 18 years, roughly $33 million in savings over that period of time. And we're also doing that uh, and, and, and chopping off, reducing the amount of amortized uh, period on these bonds uh, into a 15-year note, essentially. And so, uh, as, as Councilman Herman and, and I believe Councilman Powell somewhat inferred, what makes, what makes this somewhat challenging from time to time for organizations is the fact that we have very little control over what goes on within this pension plan. Uh, there's there's uh, the the pension the pension board and the individuals that are managing that board today have done what I consider to be yeoman's job in in trying to ultimately reduce the impacts on all of the employers from a public safety pension retirement these last several years and have been doing a very nice job in managing um, the monies and ultimately allowing cities to control a little bit of their own destiny in this. We understand that we've got, when you consider the unfunded liabilities roughly, what is it, we've got it on here, $62 million of, of both unrecognized and unfunded liability in both of our plans. What this proposal does is essentially funds that at 100%. It builds the reserve that gives us some flexibility, one for the bond rating, 
uh, which I believe will be able to um, score, essentially be rated very similar to what we have in the past, which is a double A, is, would, be, would be my intuition, which is going to generate that tax rate, uh, that very lucrative tax rate. Uh, it also allows us to recognize some type of an annual savings as well as preserve what I would consider to be capacity in our excise tax if we needed to issue more debt in the future to, for, for growth and or for facilities. Uh, we, as, as Mr. Dodd pointed out, we, we've done a very good job of managing our debt and, and certainly our resources at the city. And so, you know, our plan from a staff's perspective, our intention would be to bring back the, the various documents to have mayor and council consider, consider moving down this path and, and having a closing sometime in August or September uh, if, uh, you know, pending any additional feedback this evening. Go ahead, Mary. Um, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're moving forward on this and I appreciate the presentation and, and it, it was very clear to me. I know, you know, I've been on the council over 10 years and this is something that we talk about year after year, go to meetings when we're at the league um, about this issue. And so um, I, I understand that this is the time, you know, that we need to, to make a move here. It totally makes sense, um, you know, if we're going to go from 7.3 to 2.6%. Um, you know, and, and I feel you answered a lot of the questions we've mm -hmm. had over the years. You know, the ones that concern me was making sure that we are fully funded in the end, making sure we have a reserve strategy and, and the timing to make sure, because you need to think we pay it off and then we're right back where we are in a couple months. So I, I feel that with all of your expertise, you've, you've answered a lot of those concerns for us. I'm happy to see that we're not the first ones doing it. I mean, it's always nice to see these other cities and counties or whatever, because that's always something that I ask, you know, who else is doing it? So, um, so no, I think it, it, it looks like a good strategy. And, and Larry, I appreciate you and the staff and everyone moving, because this is something, someone asked me the other day, you know, being on the city council, is there one thing you wish that you know, would go away or that would work, you know, that you can do, and this is it. This is something that I've always, just in the back of my mind, it's just like, gosh, I just wish, you know, because the city's doing well in so many things, and this is something that um, is always there in the back of your mind and wishing it would go away. So, and Mayor, I know you've really pushed to move this, and um, all of us have, have worked hard. So, anyway, so, you know, just I appreciate everything, and I, I, I think this is the time. we got we got to do it. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Is there anything else on your presentation, or are we done? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody online. Uh, Omar, Nick, thank you guys for uh, the presentation, and uh, look forward to moving this forward. All right, we'll stand. For the opportunity. Go ahead, Omar. I'm sorry. I was just saying thank you for the opportunity to join you tonight. Okay. Good night. Good we'll night. Stand, stand adjourned for um, five minutes. We'll start again at, uh, at 5 after 7.